Well, I've introduced myself. I've told you a little bit about who I am and my family and my background. We've talked about the syllabus a little bit and what we expect to cover as we study First and Second Timothy. Now it's time to start digging the foundation. I, I said in our last section that when you build a home, at least the way they build homes uh, where I'm from, they dig a deep hole, uh, they do cement footings, they begin to build up cement uh, below the ground, and all of that is used to hold up the structure of the home itself. In fact, as I'm speaking right now, we're actually building at my church. We're adding a new sanctuary to the, to the church building that we have. And I've been fascinated to watch how much work it takes to develop the part that no one will ever see. We had a lot of rain in our, in our state in the month of June. And so we had all these deep holes and trenches dug down about seven or eight feet below the ground, about two or three meters. And they were filled with water. And so the, the construction people were pumping out the water and trying to dry it out. And we were praying that the sun would shine. And finally, there was enough dry uh, days where they were able to pour the cement in the bottom to prepare the, the strong, thick, deep footings on which the whole structure is going to sit. And just the days before we left, they had used cement block to build up to the level of the ground. And I watched them work and lift these blocks and put them here and put them here and put them here and fill in the cement. It was fascinating to watch. And then they would pour in cement and they would use iron bars to reinforce it. And finally, the, the day before we left, they began to fill in the dirt around it. And I thought, you know, by the time I come home in two and a half weeks, I'm not even going to see the work that they had done. You see, the, the importance of a foundation is not something that you're going to see but if you understand its importance and how it works and the purpose in understanding the structure itself, you're going to have a much deeper appreciation. So, for example, I could teach you 1 Timothy without digging a foundation. I could simply start with verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and I could start teaching you and say, oh, that's good, that's very interesting, you know, you can help us understand. But what I'm going to do for the next, I'm going to take quite a bit of time, we're going to go down underground and we're going to build a foundation, we're going to dig it out deep. And, and by deep, I don't mean that it's hard to understand. But my prayer is that by the time we get done with the background, you're going to say, I understand this so much better because we took the time to go underground and find out what this means. For example, why did I tell you about my family? Um, I, it's not important to this course that I tell you about my family or my background. But see, it's going to help your appreciation of me as a teacher. If I tell you about who I am, you're going to go, oh, that's right, he has the daughter from Russia. He must have a love for our country. So as I teach, you're going to be filtering your mind through those things and going, ah, see, that's part of the foundation. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the text aside for a minute or actually quite a few minutes, and begin to dig into that foundation. So let me walk you through a number of categories. Let me talk about the nature of pastoral epistles. As I said, First and Second Timothy and Titus are the three pastoral epistles. Now, the word pastoral really means shepherd. You say, oh, so is this a guidebook on how to shepherd churches? We go, no, not really. Uh, there are very many practical things here. Essentially, what these two letters do, they're written to two individuals, Timothy and Titus, and it addresses certain problems or issues that the church was having. For example, let me tell you one right now. As the gospel was spreading, the message of Christianity was becoming, oh, what should I say, um, corrupted by certain teachers. They would come into town and they would teach the gospel with this twist. And then another visiting teacher would come into town and they would teach the gospel with this twist. Or they would have this particular variation. And the churches that were being started because they were so new, uh, they would say, well, Jesus had said this and Paul was here and he said this, but Mr. Such and Such was here and he said this, which one is right? And the churches were beginning to get confused. And so part of the problem was Paul was writing to these emissaries, these designated men in these churches and saying, this is what the problem is, this is what you need to teach them. Now, is there a shepherd's heart in that? There certainly is. But these two, the nature of them is to help address issues that were going on in their church with the false teaching that was happening. Um, authorship, who, who wrote these letters? We know and we believe that to be the Apostle Paul. 
Now, as I was reading and doing background study on this, it appears that in the last couple of centuries, uh, scholars have begun to debate, well, it couldn't have been Paul for this reason, and the particular use of language, that's not really Pauline, so it must not have been him. Honestly, let's just assume that it's Paul. For several hundred years, nearly 2,000 years, virtually everyone accepted the fact that Paul was writing these two letters. I'm not going to you know, spend pages and pages trying to argue that and defend that. Let's just assume it's Paul. He names himself as the author, and so we're going to take that as an assumption of fact. Now, the date, when were these letters written? I'm not sure how much you all know about the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys, four missionary journeys, journey to Rome, uh, released from prison, we'll talk about that a little bit. But Paul's missionary journeys occupied part of the first century in the years between what we believe to be about the years 48 to the years 56. From the years 56 to 60, Paul was slowly making his way to the, through the Roman courts and then he ultimately arrived in Rome. From 61 to 62, Paul was held under house arrest in Rome and at the end of which time he was released. At least that's what we believe. Some of these things we take from history and implications of what it says. So in the five year period from 62 to 67, we believe that Paul traveled more or less quite freely. He left Timothy in the city of Ephesus, and then he left Titus in Crete, and then he subsequently wrote them each a letter. In fact, we know that he wrote Timothy two letters. So the approximate dates for this letter are between the, the, the period of 63 to 66 AD. It was sometime during and after this time that Paul was imprisoned again, and we know that 2 Timothy was written while Paul was in prison in Rome and that he was awaiting his death somewhere around the year 67. And I say, why do you give me all these dates? Because they become hooks on which we can say, oh, so this is this period of time. This is what was happening in the Roman Empire at this time. Oh, this was the emperor. Ah, because Nero was the emperor, that explains this. So all these become important in trying to understand that. So that's why we tell you a little bit about the date. Now, Paul, who is he? Maybe you know his story, maybe you've never heard of him before, so let, let me introduce you to him. Paul was, as a Jew, he was born in the city of Tar Tarsus. He was born in the city of Tarsus, which is near the Lebanese border in modern Turkey today. Uh, the citizens of this city zealously studied culture and academic discipline, so they were very well versed in the culture, were very intelligent, and we know that Paul rose through the ranks of this academic setting. Uh, he was a Roman citizen. This was very important. You could become a Roman citizen in essentially two ways. Maybe there was more. I only know of two. You could be born a Roman citizen or you could buy your Roman citizenship. And for the people who understood Roman citizenship of that, of that day, if you were born a Roman citizen, that carried more weight than if you purchased it. So it's important to know that Paul was born a Jew but he was also born a Roman citizen. That gave him certain privileges as the story has begun to be told. Second, another point about him is that he's a prominent Jewish leader. He became highly educated. He was a Pharisee. He was a leader among the Pharisees. And because he was a, a, a leading Pharisee, in the early days of Christianity, he became a persecutor of the church. In fact, th this is a man that I believe had great passions. I really look forward to meeting him someday. I think that if he were in this classroom, my personal opinion is that his personality would be overpowering. Now, I think that he was quite humble, but I think that he had such passion and such zeal in him that if he walked into a room, we would say there was electricity in the room. I think there was that kind of passion behind this man. And before he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he had this incredible passion for the, the Pharisaical version of the Jewish faith, the very legalistic interpretation of the law. And he was going to pursue that truth to the end. So when Christianity begins to rise and it begins to grow, he's saying, you know, this Christianity is a cult and it's my job as a Jew, it's my job as a Pharisee leader to make sure we root this out. And so he was very passionate to get rid of these Christians. That's why he would get the rights to have them arrested. So I want you to understand that because sometimes you're going to see in his letter a very gracious spirit, a very tender heart, and then you're going to hear him sometimes go, Timothy, you need to do this now. 
And you need to stop messing around. I mean, that's my paraphrase of his words. And in this man, I think we just have such tremendous uh, God-given gifts, but along with passion. Uh, we know that Paul visited the city of Ephesus. You say, Ephesus, what about Ephesus? Well, that's the city in which Timothy is serving when Paul writes him this letter. We're going to talk about Ephesus in a separate section. We know that he was a tireless pioneer of working among the Gentiles. Now again, first century Jewish thought, Jews, Gentiles, they don't have anything to do with each other. So for a Jewish person to understand the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and to begin to understand that the Messiah came not just for the Jewish world, but for all of the world, they, could, they couldn't even comprehend that. And Jesus Christ, or when God's commission came to Paul, God said, Paul, I'm not going to send you to the Jews primarily. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. I wonder what Paul's reaction was when he got that message. Now, Paul, as dynamic as he was and as hungry as he was and ready to go, I wonder. We'll ask him someday, hey, Paul, when you were told you're going to go to the Gentiles and not the Jews, what did you think? Did you think, great adventure? I'm, I'm ready. I want to go. I want to be the guy. Was there any part of you like Peter? Peter had to be convinced to go to the Gentiles. I can't. You know, I'm going to be dirty if I do that. Paul became this tireless leader among the Gent, and the gospel spread incredible places under his leadership. He was imprisoned under Nero's regime in Rome, somewhere around 67 AD. And we believe, now this is where tradition comes in. We don't have uh, complete factual evidence of this, that he was beheaded in 68 AD. When we get to the book of 2 Timothy, we're going to tell you what kind of agony he was in, what his mental state was in that at that time. He had this tremendous faith, but he was also waiting in this dungeon, dungeon in this prison, and he knows he's going to die. And tradition tells us that he was led outside the city, and somewhere there he kneeled down and they chopped his head off. But he was ready. He was the guy who said, you know, I'd rather go to be with the Lord, but I'll, I'll stay behind here as long as I can. He didn't want to die, but he was ready to die. So that, that's a little bit about Paul, this zealous, passionate uh, dispenser of the gospel. Let's talk about Timothy for a little bit. He's the one to whom these two letters are written. What do we know about Timothy? Very interesting young man. He's another one that one day I, I, I want to sit down in heaven with him and say, Timothy, what was it like? Um, I, I think I have a lot of things in common with Timothy. Maybe when I teach, I don't sound like I'm shy, but I'm actually a very introverted, uh, shy person. I'm as happy alone by myself with a book or with my journal as any time in my life. Even though my occupation is teaching and preaching and I love to be in front of people, I'm actually very insecure when I'm with people. And, and Timothy appears to be that kind of person. He seems to have had some health issues, but I, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. He had an interesting mix of heritage. He had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. And it sounds like his mother and his grandmother were very godly women who, who seemed to, from what we're inferring from the scriptures, introduced him to the concepts of Christianity and not just simply his Jewish faith. Timothy lived in a city called Lystra, and we believe it was there that he met Paul for the first time. And we'll talk about it when we get into the text a little bit that we don't believe that Paul introduced Timothy to Jesus Christ, that he probably already was a Christian. But when we meet him in verse 1, he, he calls Timothy, my true child in the faith. That could mean that he introduced him to Jesus Christ, or it could mean that Timothy had already been born into the family of God, and that Paul simply kind of adopted him as his spiritual child, and he's the one who helped him grow. But the, these two men have a tremendous relationship together. But honestly, I, I think that he was probably led to faith by his mother or grandmother. That's just my opinion. And that Paul was the one who became instrumental in his growth. Um, Timothy must have had certain gifts that were identified early on. And the thing that will intrigue me when we meet them someday is to see how different Paul and Timothy were. So what we know about Paul is he's an evangelist. He, he seems to have very little fear in any situation. If there was a, uh, an argument or a debate or a dialogue, Paul is right there. Timothy, on the other hand, seems to be the guy that would be willing to wait back behind the scenes. Hey, Paul, when you're done, just let me know. 
But Timothy seems to have had real strong gifts in teaching. Maybe again, that's why I, I like this young man, because I have gifts of teaching. It's what I live to do. I, I love to explain things. And, and what I think God was so wise in bringing these two men together, you have an evangelist who is passionate about the gospel, who would fall on a sword in a second for the gospel, paired up with a young man who has fears and insecurities but loves to teach. So what you have is a point man who would go into a city, into the synagogues, into the temple, and would argue and debate, and all kinds of people would get saved, and then he would say, Timothy, now teach them. Timothy, tell them what it means. It wasn't that Paul didn't know those things. He knew those things, but Paul was already off to another city. Timothy, let's go. Let's go to the next city. We've already introduced people to Christ here. Let's go. But there comes a time when Paul says to Timothy, hey, Timothy, I've been in Ephesus a long time, and we're going to talk about that. He was there between two and a half and three years. Timothy, it's time for me to go. I want you to stay here. You need to teach them. So I just think it's, it's God's wisdom in bringing these two men together is just unbelievably great. I, I think his plan and purpose is just fantastic. Uh, some qualities about Timothy that we kind of infer from the, he seems to be passive. He needs a little bit of a push. Hey, Timothy, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. He seems to be rather timid or shy. He seems to be rather easily intimidated. Uh, I'm kind of that way. Uh, we have in our church, we have a couple of very strong people that when they, uh, I don't know how to describe it to you in a particular way, but it kind of goes like this. Bruce, we need to do this and we need to do it right now. And if I have a different opinion, there's part of me that says, I should say something, but I don't have the courage to do that. But there are some times when I say, you know, what they're asking us to do, I don't believe that that's the way God is leading us. I need to take a stand here and say, I don't think that that's what we need to do. See, that's what Paul does with Timothy. Tim somebody would come on strong to Timothy. Hey, Timothy, that was a terrible message. That was a terrible lesson that you taught. You're teaching the wrong thing. And Timothy would kind of go, eh, I don't know why I'm here. I don't like being here. I wish I was with Paul. It was a lot more fun when I was with Paul. I don't like this at all. And Paul wrote in these letters, hey, Timothy, come on. I left you here for a reason. Let's go. Get in the game. We, we have an expression, get in the game. Let's go. Get active. Don't, don't let them look down on you because of who you are or how young you are or how intimidated you are. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And so he, he needed to be pushed a little bit. And there's nothing wrong with that. He was affectionate and he was fearful, both of those things. He needed some admonitions to kind of, Timothy, don't, don't give in to that. Uh, we believe that he had some health issues. Paul at one point encourages him to take some wine, not for the sake of the effect of the wine, but for the sake of his stomach or his insides. So he appears to be, and I don't know if you had a, a kid like this in your school, but kind of the, the short little kid that didn't really play all the games and, and, you know, was more comfortable reading a book and he wasn't the most popular kid in your school. That's what I imagine Timothy to be like. We'll find out if that's actually true one day. Paul, he's the go-getter. Let's get in there. Timothy is like, ah. So a wonderful young man. And again, God's, God's amazing wisdom in bringing these two together. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Uh the next section I would talk about would be the relationship of Timothy to Paul. We've already talked about that a little bit. And I mentioned how Paul in the very first, second verse says, my true child in the faith and the connection that they had. But there's a couple of places in the scriptures where I actually would like you to see how they come together. The first one is the books of, book of Acts. And so what I'm going to do is show you a couple of places where their stories interconnect because it gets to laying this foundation. So Acts chapter 16 and a few verses that we're going to read there, verses 1 through 5. So Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. If you want to find it in your Bibles, you might want to hit pause on the recording a bit to find it. 
Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. And then if you can find the 16th chapter, then you'll find the first five verses, and I'm going to read that with you now. This is what it says. Paul also came to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy. See, this is our introduction to him, the first time we've seen him here. The son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Circum circumcision was a big thing to them back then, and it was part of not just the culture, but part of the, the religious backing. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily." So what we see is the two of them getting acquainted and getting together, and Paul saying, Hey, Timothy, come with me. Come with me. We're going to go visit some churches, and you're going to watch, and you're going to learn, and you're going to see what we're about, and we're going to help spread the gospel. So this would help to build this young man's confidence. Uh, we don't know exactly how old he would have been at this time, but he was, would, would have been considered young. Of course, everything under the age of 30 then would have been considered young, because you reached manhood as a Jewish man at the age of 30, which again, uh, an aside to that would be Jesus Christ. Uh, as a rabbi, he becomes a rabbi at the age of 30, but that's an aside to this right now. So they meet, they get acquainted. Now I'm going to turn over to the letter called 1 Thessalonians. It's two letters before the one we're going to look at. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and we're going to see these two men together again. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And in a moment I'll begin reading it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith. See, see what Timothy's role was? to establish and exhort you in your faith. See, this is an encourager. This is a guy who, Paul is the dynamic one, and he comes rushing in like a tidal wave, and he says, Timothy, I left you behind because you needed to just work on the relationships with them. So uh, let me continue. That no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter would have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. He says, I, I don't want to mess up what God is doing. And so that's why I have to leave Timothy behind so that he can work with you and he can encourage you and he exhort you and, and he can prompt you and he can push you a little bit. Uh, in a lot of different places, he's considered to be Paul's fellow worker, so we know that the two of them traveled together. Um, but it was on the, Paul's third missionary journey that the two of them were together in the city of Ephesus. It was from Ephesus that Paul sent him on to Macedonia in the north, then he was with Paul in Macedonia, and then they came back to Ephesus, and Timothy accompanied Paul again through the area, and, and later P Timothy was with Paul in Rome, and from there possibly made another trip to the city of Philippi. So you say, well, I can't remember all that. You don't need to remember all that. What you want to get a picture of is these two men traveling with, a, with an entourage of people visiting different cities, and Paul recognizing the gifts that this young man had and said, Timothy, here, here's what you can do here. Timothy, I've got to go to this meeting. I've got to go to this debate. I'm going to go to this dis discussion. But Timothy, I want you to stay here. I want you to work with these people and teach them. And again, I just see uh, amazing things here. At the end of the book of Acts, Paul was under the house arrest in Rome. So right at the end of the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 28, uh, some of what we begin to learn then happens by inference. And we say, well, what happened next? So here's what we believe happened. Following his trial under Caesar and before his acquittal, Paul evidently left Rome. So he was released. He made his way eastward. He eventually landed in the city of Ephesus, a city where he had spent uh, two and a half to three years, and, and probably for other provinces. When Paul left Ephesus, this is when he left Timothy there in charge. And we're going to talk about Ephesus in a few minutes in our next section. 
but this amazing metropolitan city with not just one church, but a variety of churches, and, and, and leaving him the possibility that I want to get together with you again. So one last thing before we take another break is, is to discuss where each of these guys is when 1 Timothy is written. So when 1 Timothy is written, where's Paul? As near as we can tell that he's north in Macedonia. That if, if Timothy was left in Ephesus, Paul had continued to travel north around the sea and he writes somewhere in his travels from Macedonia. Timothy, as we've alluded to, is in the city of Ephesus and he's left to stay there for quite a period of time. And we also believe that Timothy is still there uh, when we when it comes to 2 Timothy. Now I think what I'm going to do at this point is take a bit of a break because uh, our next section I want to talk about the city of Ephesus. And you say, well, what do I need to know about Ephesus for? This, this is an amazing city. So again, we're building a foundation, right? We've dug a deep hole. We're beginning to pour the footings. We're beginning to build the block that is underneath this whole letter. Ephesus is an amazing city that when you get an understanding of what's happening in the city at this time, one of the seven wonders of the world is there, which I'll tell you about in a couple of minutes. They're going to say, wow, the fact that Paul would trust a shy, introverted teacher like Timothy in a place like that, he must have really trusted this guy. And that God must have really laid a burden on him to do some amazing work here. So. We're going to come back to that. So what we're doing is building the foundation. We've talked about Paul. We've talked about Timothy. We've talked about where they are. And we're going to come back in a couple of minutes and talk about Ephesus as a city and what God was doing there at this time. So we'll take a break at this time. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.